So, in the 1986 anime film Fist of the North Star, Kenshiro is the strongest good boy in all of the post-apocalyptic Mad Max hellscape. He and his fiancée are out for a walk, probably looking for food and water because there isn't any, and a bad boy named Shin kidnaps Yuria. Kenshiro fights a bunch of mid-bosses and then finally fights Shin, and that's the movie. Everyone's head explodes twice, and it's gross. Fist of the North Star is ridiculously graphic, but in a way that is so over the top that it manages to penetrate the threshold of camp. And I'm sorry, anime fans, I know there are multiple names and pronunciations for these characters depending on the dub and sub, but this is what I got. So let's talk about the world that these blood beefcakes inhabit. Due to a misunderstanding of the term, some would label the current state of humanity in the film as that of anarchism, but that is not what anarchism means. See, anarchism actually means horizontal leadership or without leaders, not without laws. The minor kingdoms and roving gangs of the world of Fist of the North Star actually more closely resembles a cretocracy, a ruling body established and maintained by force and coercion. And if this movie has anything, it's ruling bodies. Alright, mood whiplash time. Historically, many of the worst regimes to ever blight the earth, or regimes that committed war crimes, only contain some qualities of a cretocracy due to their origins. Ferdinand Marcos was democratically elected as an idolized figure of the resistance against the Japanese in World War II. He also silenced the media in the Philippines, used violence against his political opposition, and was one of the worst human rights abusers of the post-World War II 20th century. Robert Mugabe was elected with great popular support. He was also responsible for ordering massacres of his own people in Zimbabwe. Adolf Hitler was elected into power in 1933. While Nazi Germany certainly used a great amount of force to maintain power, that's not how it achieved power. A cretocracy is perhaps both violently achieved, violently maintained, and perhaps the most pure form of cretocracy is one that has no other ideology except strength. Revolutions that begin violently and then establish a government that commits violence is not necessarily a cretocracy either because it both maintains power in other ways and has an ideology beyond violence. The term cretocracy was popularized by 19th century Russian philosopher and anarchist Peter Kropotkin. In his book, Mutual Aid, he denounced violence and coercion as a means of maintaining power, saying, In the animal world, we have seen that the vast majority of species live in societies, and that they find in association the best arms for the struggle for life, understood, of course, in its wide Darwinian sense, not as a struggle for the sheer means of existence, but as a struggle against all natural conditions unfavorable to the species. The animal species in which individual struggle has been reduced to its narrowest limits and the practice of mutual aid has attained the greatest development are invariably the most numerous, the most prosperous, and the most open to further progress. The unsociable species, on the contrary, are doomed to decay. In Fist of the North Star, we see how a true cretocracy would work, or not work. Everyone's head literally detonates and it tells us a lot about the usefulness or uselessness of strength as a virtue unto itself. A trait without a goal except to perpetuate itself is not much of a virtue at all. We see this actually addressed in the film, so points for that. Following a vacuum in power, Rao seeks Ryukan. He insists on becoming the new Fist of the North Star due to his incredible strength, but Ryukin says that strength without purpose and perception is useless. Ryokin condemns the concept of cretocracy, as he does not see strength alone as a virtue. Well put, movie. I mean, really, the story's world-building of a land where only the man with the best karate rules is more in service to showing outlandish and graphic fight scenes than in service to commentary on political power structures, but whatever. This is what we got. So let's get back to the beginning of the film. Shin comes into power and maintains his power over his gang because he is physically the strongest. He can put his fingers into Kenshiro's chest and it's no big deal. His mastery of martial arts and impossible bodybuilding physique in a time of food scarcity impresses or frightens his people enough to call him leader and for his power to be affirmed. The first action we see Shin accomplish is the kidnapping of Kenshiro's fiancée, Yuria. 
Remember violence and coercion? First, he assaults Kenshiro. Violence. Then, as a means of making Yuria compliant, he tortures Kenshiro until she agrees to come along quietly. Coercion. Throughout Kenshiro's quest to rescue her, he encounters others who have exercised strength-based gangs and small governments. Rao has amassed an army largely through violence and through a cult of personality centered around his physical abilities. As this happens, the audience might conjure the phrase, Might makes right. The notion associated with the phrase is that a society's view of morality is determined by those currently in power. If Shin is in a leadership position, and Shin uses violence to get what he wants and to keep his underlings alive, then violence is moral to them, and anything resembling mercy, pacifism, or diplomacy is a sign of weakness. This might sound ridiculous, of course, but on a broader scale and in a less aggressive context, this has some validity as it relates to real-world governments. A government determines what is law, what is allowed, and this official stamp of approval changes public perception over time due to the normalization of its practice in society. For example, a socially divisive issue, once normalized by law, sometimes loses a little of its toxicity. Not all, but some. The difference between laws and standards created and enforced by a liberal democracy and a cryptocracy, as seen in the film, is that in the former this is a symbiotic relationship. Movements become law usually only after there is enough public support, and therefore less risk, for the politicians to pass a proposed bill into law. In Fist of the North Star, Shin and other physically imposing men exert their will purely through force, regardless of popularity. In fact, it is this force that solidifies popularity, not in the man's ideology or character, but in ability. Shin's men do not follow him because he has good ideas. It's not that they elected him leader, they are just not as powerful as him, and they have no choice. Now, the phrase might makes right is sometimes a condemnation of the fact that those in power determine the rightness of action, but it also can be used by proponents of the concept not that those who rule determine law, but the concept that cultures that are more powerful, or the best at violence, should rule and therefore determine the law. And you can see this attitude everywhere from widespread historical revisionism that whitewashes violence committed during colonialism as historically, historically for, for the, the greater, greater good, good, to how it manifests on a sociological level as seen in the rise of those who advocate strength itself as a virtue, irrespective of context, and think anyone who has a conscience about the consequences of such a mindset is too cucked to understand what it means to be a real man. Anyway, justification for cryptocracy is, philosophically speaking, garbage because it's unsustainable and does nothing to protect the populace, which is what a government is supposed to do. And people generally get that, but there are psychological and sociological components to how we view strength that have convinced people that aggression is a positive unto itself, even if those people will not say that society should be run like a Mortal Kombat tournament. I'll make a whole video on that another time. Did I mention that this movie is gross? It is. Hi everyone, if you like what I do, please click on the orange Patreon link below. That's how this show happens. It's also the only way to request an episode. Also, please like, share, subscribe, and click on the notification bell so that you never miss an episode. I'll see you next week.